Why don't we open with a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together as a group to, to look at what your word uh, talks about on a, on a difficult topic. So, Lord, we pray that you guide and direct us as we sort these things out. Help us to make good and wise decisions. And, Lord, help us especially to seek to be faithful, to always follow your word in whatever church setting we might find ourselves. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. So building on the social justice issues, we're going to look at complementarianism and egalitarianism. Uh, first of all, we're going to have the case for egalitarianism. Is what are the arguments that people use to, to say, this is why I accept it. Uh, and I think it's good to know both sides, to sort it out and to understand what's, what's going on. It's a, I think that's uh, beneficial for all of us to be able to say, this is why they hold it. Even if you disagree with them and even if you disagree strongly with them, it's good to know where they get this from. And so if it's at least an attempt to try draw things from Scripture, then we can, then we can have a discussion. It's, and with the social justice stuff, when they're drawing it from everything but Scripture, then it's no, there's really no discussion to have. And so that's really what we're going to try to sort out. And so uh, tonight, again, we'll look at egalitarianism and sort of what is the case for it. And then the, the next two lessons will pr focus primarily on the complementarianism with a few other topics sort of blended in there to sort, to sort it out. And so the first point we need to understand is that this is about roles. This is about positions. It's about uh, uh, things within the church. How do we understand them? Who can do them? Uh, who does God say yes to? Who does God say no to? Or does he not say yes or no to anybody? And is the doors just wide open? And so we have to see that the differences are not about how either side of the issue values men or women. So the idea of this is no matter which side you're on, you're not saying, well, men are better and, th and therefore they have these positions and women are lower and so they have this, that, a lower position. That's not what this is about. This is all about what roles we play within the church. And again, it's related in many ways to also the ideas of what roles we play within marriage, what roles we play within families as men and women also. So we have to understand that and what this does then, too, is it takes the attacks out. If you're saying that we acknowledge that there's value in both, then you take the personal attacks out, and then you can focus on what does the Bible actually say. What does Scripture tell us? Instead of getting into the personal attacks, well, I, I like people more than you do, or that type of stuff, it's instead focusing on what does Scripture say. So in Christianity, both sides of the issue value men and women as full image bearers of God. That's, that's where you have to begin. There's an equality before God. But does that equality necessarily mean that every role is equal? Does that mean every thing has to be the sameness? And so that's what you, you, part of what the, our discussion is. And so both sides see men and women as children of God and their full holding a special dignity. So again, we're not going to get into fights or battles where you, where you demean other people because that's your best argument. We've all been in those arguments where you're trying to talk scripture, you're trying to talk facts or details, and somebody wants to go into the personal negatives. So we want to avoid that going forward. We want to say, no, no, we value women and we value men the same as image bearers before God. But again, does image bearers before God then require us to be identical? Does it require sameness or can there be distinctions between people and still we hold these uh, image bearers equal? And I believe we probably can, but that becomes part of the, the question. So the question again is of roles, the roles of men and women. What, what responsibilities do they have? What tasks do they have? What's the biblical foundation for this? How do we, how do we understand it? And again, it, it overlaps between family, marriage, and then into the church because the principles are basically the same. So the same would be, would be in the family also. We would see husbands and wives as full image bearers. 
we would see children as full image bearers. We'd also understand the roles between the parents and the children is, is a lot different, and yet we would say value is the same. Roles may differ, values are the same. That's, that's what the, the battle is really about. So the question is whether God has established different roles for men and women within marriage, the family, and the church. And again, like I said, our focus primarily is, is from the, the church aspect, but again, these, these have overlap. So some of the texts that will be used sort of can be used for, for both arguments. How do we understand them? How do we, how do we see them? And so connected to the idea of roles is whether God's word has established a, a hierarchy in relation to these, these two distinct roles. Now we live in a land that nobody likes hierarchies. Uh, maybe I should define hierarchies first. A hierarchy is any system of persons or things that's ranked one above another. And so it, it's a power structure. And so do we accept hierarchies? Part of the social justice movement is that there are no hierarchies. You have to destroy all the hierarchies. You have to throw them all out. But what you end up with, if you look at any Marxist or communist country, is they haven't gotten rid of the hierarchy. They've just replaced it with different people. And oftentimes it's far more cruel than what was, what was before it. You can imagine all the, the Ukrainians that were starved to death by Stalin probably would have liked the czar better. The czar wasn't a nice guy by any means, but he was sure a lot nicer than Stalin was. And so you have to look at those things. And so a hierarchy then within the church is, are there different roles that we can have and still have people of equal value? And I think we saw that in, in the text of 1 Timothy. You have elders that rule the church. That's a hierarchy. That's established in Scripture by the men that that Christ had appointed to go out into the world to, to spread the gospel and to build his church. And so we see that. We see that also within deacons. There was a particular role that, that they had. Uh, and so we see that there is a hierarchy. There's a, and all of them, we understand too, then would, would submit to Christ. And that submission includes then our submission to God's word. Our submission to Christ is found in our submitting to God's Word, and that's part of why we're, we're looking at it this way, too, is what, is what does God's Word say about this? It's not what philosophy or attitudes or, or worldly ideas I want to bring into the church. It's what God's Word say about this, and that's where we have to, to really go with. So now, egalitarianism, this is what we're going to focus on tonight, holds a belief in equal political, economic, and social status for all people. And again, really part of the goal here is one of sameness. And again, they, they press the, the equal in economics is that could be a forced thing. Again, we see that in the social justice movement is, is it's not just that you recognize that there's differences, but that you're going to force everybody to be the same or equal. Same thing with, with social status. The problem is with this is they flatten it all out and they bring everybody down instead of lifting every, everybody up. And so part of that is within the egalitarian context is they want everything equal. They want sameness for, for everybody, particularly the idea between men and women. But then again, now we get into uh, the LBGTQ stuff, which also is the, the same principles and theories. So in the family or in marriage, that would mean there is no leadership or submission, as husbands and wives could equally fill all roles. And we see that uh, all you have to do is watch commercials. What do you see men doing in commercials? You ever see them in suits going to work? They're playing with the kids. They're doing the laundry. They're making the food, none of which in and of themselves are a bad thing to do. But the idea is they're trying to force this idea of egalitarianism to say men should do all of this stuff. And it's quite likely that the, the wife then will come through the door with some sort of business dress on and she'd be the, the breadwinner. And so that's sort of what you see in, in our culture. In the church, that would mean that all of the offices or positions would then be open to all without any hierarchy based upon sex. And so there the idea of a, would be 
the, the opening the door to both men and women pastors, men and women elders, men and women deacons, and any other type of leadership position that you might hold. And so here they would make no distinctions. Now we saw when we did 1 Timothy, there was a lot of uh, uh, sort of characteristics that the leaders had to have. And so even at that, it wouldn't, have, wouldn't be open to everybody because you, you, you simply can't open it to, to everybody. There's, there's levels that they have, and so that's part of what you have to take into account too. But you can't get away from a hierarchy. You know, churches that try to run everything uh, strictly on a congregational basis where the congregation has to, uh, to pass everything are ones that are wasting a lot of time, not entrusting any leaders, and a lot of times it's just power plays, you know. Which, what color is the, the room going to be? What color is the carpet going to be? You know, how many bottles of water and how many jugs of coffee do we have to order each week? Well, that's the, the, the congregation doesn't need to be doing those things. You appoint people to, to, to deal with such, such issues. And so there is going to be hierarchy no matter what type of system you're in. And part of that is because of, of sin issues, but that's a, another topic. So now many of the issues concerning the distinctions between men and women really took root in society, starting with the, the feminism of the 60s. Now there was, there was somewhat of a push, a little bit of a push before that. You saw some of it come into, in the, the 1800s already, some of it in the early 1900s. Oftentimes it was connected to, to what would have been some of the cults, but then also uh, the charismatic and Pentecostal movements opened these, these doors up. And so that was sort of the beginnings, but the real push came not from church stuff, but from sort of societal and cultural issues out of the 60s. That's really what began to, to drive this issue even in the, in the church. And today some go so far as to claim that there are not any real biological differences between men and women, such as sports, military, work, etc. All you have to do is watch a, a man and a woman in an MMA fight uh, and see the destruction that happens and you'll know that there are, are differences and you can't avoid it. And so, 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 so maybe they, maybe they want to go, people want to go a little too far. But again, it all fits under the same principles. Are we all identical, which an egalitarianism would be, or the complementarianism where we have differences, but those differences complement each other. And oftentimes that's, that's one what would be the more liberal side and the other that would be the more conservative side. So now does opening certain roles only to some amount to sexism or discrimination? Because that becomes quickly the charge. Again, if it's just about roles, then we can have this discussion about what does scripture say? As soon as we make it about this, we make it something personal, and we, we take our sight off of what Scripture says, and we say, well, you demean women. I lift them all up. I acknowledge them, their place or their position. And so we have to understand that as soon as we get into this, we, we're shutting down the, the conversation. We're shutting down what does Scripture say. And so we have to avoid making those kind of accusations and say, now what does the Bible say? Sort of make your case, and we'll go from there. And that's part of what I hope to do in this, this class. So any questions or comments about the first part? Yeah, you're hearing more and more like the argument that um, gender roles are just a social construct, right? Yep. And that it doesn't exist. And so then again, then the question for the idea of roles is, who created those roles? Are those God-given roles that are built into us, or are they this social construct? Is it just something society came up at one time? Was it, was it men a couple thousand years ago, or several thousand years ago, said, we want to rule the world, and you poor women just have to be subject to us? Is, is that what drove it? That would be the social construct. Or was this the, the God-ordained creation order that was given? And so those become part of those discussions and argument. Which, which is it? How, how, do we, how do we see it? So, Okay, the next little section is egalitarianism. 
So egalitarianism would say that all roles are equal and they would call for sameness. And again, that's the push that you get in the social justice movement, but that's also the Marxist push. You have to understand that that's, that this, that's linked. You just watch the, the, the communist Chinese when they're all wearing the identical clothes, they have the identical haircuts, they have the identical looks. That's, that's where some of this goes. That's sort of the Marxist side of it. Now, it doesn't mean that because you support this that you're necessarily a Marxist, but it opens the door. And that's where social justice brings that in. So yeah, like the social justice movement, you hear the term equity, which is not equality, it's, oh, it's... It's tied with this egalitarian thing. Yeah, equity, everything's gotta be the same. Doesn't matter what you've done or what you've accomplished, everything has to be the same. The other guy has to have the same. The, the other woman has to have the same. You can't have distinctions. Equal outcome, and so if, if you see two, two individuals, you, they're not gonna end up in the same spot. You have to do something about that. And they would have, the government would, would do something like that. But again, that's the principles that you, that you find in some of that. And so it doesn't mean, again, that if you accept this, that you're automatically also buying into everything else. You, you can't make that, we can't make that assumption. But again, it, it does open the door to that, that thinking. Uh, again, the, it's the train car thing. If you accept the one thing, are you forced to, to accept the next social justice train car and then the next social justice until you've bought into the, the whole package? And so that's the argument Bodhi Bakum makes, is that you can't take the first car and then say, I'm going to detach the others from it. Eventually, you're going to get pulled into to accepting all of them. So this view would claim, though, that in the original creation that there was no headship or submission. And so they, they look at Scripture, and we're going to look at Scripture at, at how they do it. So I, I want to try at least give that a, a legitimate voice tonight to say, what, do they, what are their arguments? And so I've listened to people, I've read stuff, I've, uh, like I said, our denomination has, gone, has fought this battle and has a split in the 90s over it. So I've, I've heard both sides for, for a long time. And so what I'm going to try to do tonight is to say, this is their argument. What can we do with it? What can we see with it? And then the next go round, we'll look at the complementary side and say, what do we do with that? How do we understand that? What, what, what is his argument? Is it as sound as the other? Can we, can we accept one or the other? But again, this would have no headship or submission prior to the fall. It's a creation order would have gotten rid of that. And so Genesis 1.26 would be a text that, that they would go to. It said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. So, so it's the them have dominion is one of the areas that they would, would point to then. And over the livestock and over all the earth and every, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so egalitarianism would say that there was a co-equal dominion, that the, the both roles were completely the same before that. And so the, it was over the earth and its creatures. Now, they would say that that implies then that the roles by necessity would all have been the same. And then therefore it's either slave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then a question that you could bring in then is, does dominion over these things necessarily mean that each one's roles are, are the same? Could you still have distinct roles even though you both have equal dominion? Because here it's over the creatures. Here it's not even including kids or anything yet. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they're Depends what day it is. Yes, yeah. yes. So that would be one of the, the things they would look at. Again, it was it's co-equal, and so it would claim that the text teaches us the, of a shared dominion and an equality of roles for men and women before the fall. And again, so then the idea is if if they can establish this before the fall to say that this is the way it was, then that should be what we should try to get back to. That would be a part of the, the argumentation. But the question is, between the two, is ultimately, 
when we look at both sides is which case is stronger, the, the one that says this is what it was before the fall, you didn't have any of this, uh, uh, any distinctions, or had there been a hierarchy at the very beginning in creation order to start with. And so... Yeah. Well, well they, they do. It's they bring out scripture, but, but the higher, it's, it's, it's the interpretations. God. It's God, and then He created Adam, and then He created Eve, and even before the fall, He had assigned them. But they they would say that because before the fall, it doesn't really define the roles they had. It's at the fall that then you have the discussion of of children and childbirth, and then you have weeds in the men's field. Any issue with that, Mr. Farmer, that there's weeds in your field yet? Roundup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, but I was going to say in 2.20, so Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So that helper kind of indicates. Well, no, you're getting ahead of us. Once again, once again, we'll get to that text. And so, because they'll have, there, there's an answer to, to that. Yes. So, so again, here they would say that there was shared dominion, and so the, the, the roles were necessarily equal. Where a complementarian would say, well, the, even if they had equal dominion, the roles under that may have, have varied could have been an umbrella of this is what dominion is, this is what the men do, this is what the women do, and that could have been created order. So that would be sort of the discussion when you go back and forth with these. And so then Genesis 2.18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Sound familiar? Yes. And so <laughs> the question then becomes, what do we do with that? A helper fit. Does that mean, well, that, you know, that's sort of like a secondary person, a lesser person, or is, is it an equal person? Some people see, well, helper, that, that means Adam's the boss and the lady has to listen. All right, you know, but that would be some of the, the thinking. But the problem comes in that since the term in Hebrew for helper is also used of God helping man, this term would not necessitate a submissive role for women. It could be a side-by-side -side thing. Maybe the, the day when, when you have two combines and John drives one and you drive the other one, then you have equal roads in your, in your farming. And so, but you're still his helper, right? Yeah. She wouldn't be equal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> so, so... But, but the argument, as soon as you go to Psalm and you find out that helper was also used of God, that, then that sort of changes how we have to, have to say this. You can't force this to mean it's subordinate when God is clearly not subordinate to us. And so the context might shape some of that, but, but you, it's hard to dive in and say, well, this word means that it must be that way because it's used differently elsewhere. That's, yeah, you, I might do some of that too, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but we have to understand the, the broader terms of words, so, sort of like this morning with, with, with Romans, does all mean all, when we could see in Romans 11, all can't mean all, because there's other things in scripture that say that's impossible. And so we have to say, well, then it has to be all within or something. And so we see that you have to see the larger picture. But as soon as they can find this in, in Psalms and say, see, it's applied to God also, that would undermine any complaint up here that someone else would say. So you have to see that, that that's, that's a legitimate thing to say that we, we have to be cautious how we would use, that, uh, use and understand helper in that verse. It would claim that as man's helper, woman... Women and men would be co-equal in their work. You're both driving the combines. You're co-equal in your, in, in, in your work. So 
And and so, but that would that would be the, that would that would be the thought. That's what they have GPS for. Drive straight rows. Yes. Uh, anyway, so again, you you can see where their argumentation would would come. That if you're going to throw this one at them, they would say, well, what about this verse? And so they would say, well, since this is this way, then we can apply this. And so it, it's it's not an unbiblical thought. They're using scripture to to to. Uh, to sort of support their, their case. Okay, in the text speaking of becoming one flesh, it would claim that this proves equality. We, we know Adam started, but they would say that in the, in the description of marriage, that that in the end shows that there's, that there's a sameness and in, inequality. And so Genesis 2, 22 through 24 says, and the rib that the Lord had taken, the Lord God had taken from the man he made. It, and the rib, get my eyes here right. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. Note the one thing though is there are still two different names. And that's, that's an important thing also. And because she was taken out of the man, therefore the man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so now the, the argumentation would be then, see, they're one. There's an equality there. But then you'd have to ask yourself, can you take two separate things and join them together into one thing, and yet each, each half is different? Can each side be, have distinctions? And so that would be your, your question, back and forth, that if you have a discussion. Well, it's similar to being called the body of Christ. Every, all people have, if you're in the body, you're, you've had salvation, you're equal before Christ, you have Christ's righteousness, yep. they do different functions. It's sim it could be that. Could be similar to that, I don't know. It yeah. could just mean different flesh parts of the body. Well, you have a lot of tractor parts that have smaller parts, that to have your one working part, to have your gear that works, actually is more than one part to make your gear work, right? So you have one gear that you talk about, and yet there's parts and pieces that have to work together to make it a workable gear. And so that would be that idea. That would sort of be the complementarian view. The other would be that, no, no, it's a single part now, and there's no separating the two in any sense. They go the same direction with homo, uh, or what do you call it, homosexuals and stuff too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they try to say it's all the same. Yeah, the sameness. Yeah. And so you again, all of these things uh, sort of overlap. They're not always direct ties, but they, but at a minimum, a, a lot of this overlaps. And so the claim would be that before the fall into sin, there was no type of hierarchy or headship of Adam or over Eve. There is one important thing. Uh, this here, she will be called woman. Adam named what he was over. All of the animals he named, not just because they needed names that showed that God had placed Adam over them. God has a right to name things. You, when you have the right to name something, you're, you're over them. You have the right to name your children because you're over them. And so that would be one thing that you could look back to and say, well, what about that? What about the, the naming? Because that's an important idea in the Old Testament and, and in Hebrew. Um, like in the Hebrew, when you look at the name man, the word man and the name woman, um, how, how do they... Can you see any significance in, in that? I, I believe the one term is, is well, they, there's some different one, but there's one that's like ish and one's isha or something like, like that, where you can see the one word was drawn directly from the, from the other word. And so uh, that would be, you know, s similarities that way. And that's also in, in the English, where you have the, the similarities between man and woman, that there's the connection. But again, it's the naming part that becomes important in there. How, how do we understand that? Okay, and then it, it would say that sin created the need for a hierarchy.
So they would say that there was sameness in, until the curse came along. And so we have to, have to look at that and see, see what the argumentation is. So this vo verse would point to the verse con concerning Eve's punishment after the fall into sin as the beginning of the hierarchy. So since she ate first, she's, she's going she's gonna to be subjected now or, or something, something on that order. And so they would say that prior to this, creation order was never that way. There was no need for hierarchy before that. It's only sin that brought the, this need in. And so the, the verse is Genesis 3.16. It says, To the woman, he, that's God, said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Uh, just this underlined part, too. Uh, make sure you have a good translation of that. The ESV has one of the better translations because in the Hebrew, there's this antagonism that's expressed that you don't find in all the English translations. So you have to understand that, that that's there. And so now we have to see the curse contained a, a few different aspects. The first was pain in childbirth. Well, you can take some medications, but usually there still remains some pain in childbirth. Not that I personally know, but anyway, that's out there. I think there's another aspect to this, because I think it's beyond just that moment of, of childbirth. I believe this curse includes the possibility of pain in raising children, because we soon follow this story with Cain and Abel, the one child killing the other child. Imagine the pain the mother, Eve, felt in seeing the one son kill another son. Well, and then in the Proverbs, too, it always talks about, there's always a distinction, like, that naughty child that grieves the mother's heart. And I was one of them. And then, <laughs> and then something, it's something different to the father, yep. like to them, not to the mother and that. But, like, it's always a grieving kind of yep. thing, like with the, yep. with the mother. Yeah, so I was doing a sermon on that many years ago, and, I, and that one kind of just jumped out to me. I think this goes beyond just that moment. This, this is that lifelong thing that the mother aches over what happens to her, her children, whether it's the, the physical problems of sin or, or whether it's their own sin that they're wandering or astray or, or something like that. And then the, the third part would be husbands ruling over their wives. So they would say this didn't exist beforehand. Now, you might say this did exist beforehand, but it wasn't antagonistic beforehand. That the sin brought the negative side of that ruling into place. And so you have the women on one side trying to overthrow that ruling, but then you also throughout history have the men oppressing the women. You know, you see a lot of that within Islam, Islamic societies and tribal societies in Africa and so forth. It's still a very real thing. Uh, Southeast Asia, these are, these are prominent things. I, India, this principle where the, the, the wife still has to walk behind the husband, those types, types of things still exist. And so, so was it that the ruling began or was it the trouble between the two began? But again, they would say that the ruling didn't begin until the fall. And that, that would, that's how we have to see that verse. So this view would say, now Christ has overcome the curse of sin so we can get rid of the hierarchy and return to the pre-fall st status. And so they would say, now, since Christ came, the curse is dealt with. In a way, yes, and in a way, no, right? The curse price has been paid for our sins, you still have weeds in your field? The ground still get hard? You still fight weather day in and day out? Yeah, affects your crops, both of you, right? Yeah, so you have to say, well, the whole curse isn't gone. We live in this fallen world yet in which the, the consequences of that curse remain. So then can we say, well, we'll get rid of some and, and only have We'll get, rid, you know, we'll get rid of the one, but the other ones we just have to live with yet. But again, that becomes sort of the thought. And so, again, they, they look to Scripture. They're not denying Scripture, but this is how they, how they would interpret Scripture. And so then the question becomes, in the discussions, is it a legitimate way? 
Or is there other ways that we should see this and, and, and need to see this? So any questions on this section? Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Like if, even if it was set up, we still live in a fallen world. So it's like if you're still dealing with the consequences of it. So like how would you answer that if someone said, you know, well, this is how it was before, without even having to combat that to say, well, we're now living yeah. like this. We can't go back to walking in the garden face to face with God anymore. We're not doing that. And again, you have uh, scripture, uh, Romans 8. The whole creation groans. Yeah. The, the, the curse is not gone yet in, in that sense. The consequences of, of what happened in the garden still impact us. We get old. We get sick. We get broken. We have things fall apart. We get diseased. We have all sorts of different struggles that people die. It's not until we get to the next life that we get the promise of Revelation 21 where all of those things are gone. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. There is no mourning. There is no death. But that's, that's not our experience yet today. You know, in the past year, we've, we've had to bury people who were close to us, right? In the past few years, you know, even the congregation, within the congregation, but a lot of their family and relatives and friends, we've, we've seen this over and over. So that, that aspect of the curse is not gone. The price, the ultimate price, sin, which is death, separation from God, for believers is overcome. But is the other stuff. And the other reality is not until Christ comes again. Not until everything's renewed. Okay. Now, biblical female leadership. They, this is where they'll, they'll go next. How do we look at these? How do we understand these? How, do, how should we, we take in this, this argumentation? Okay, these were the 15, 16, 17, 18. These were still those pagan. Egalitarian. The whole night is, is egalitarianism. Is yep. Yep, and how they would look at these texts and use these texts. And so you have to say, is it a legitimate way? Was it a, a special time, a unique time, that, that God did worked in a different way? You know, sometimes you have to be careful to say, well, we're going to make the exception to the rule the rule. You know, you, you have that in other things in life where, where well, the abortion que question. Well, they, they never want to deal with the question of healthy babies born to mothers who are healthy. They want to always want to go to rape or incest or medical issues. So they always want to make the exception the rule. And so can we do that here? So that becomes one of the questions. How do we, how do we unpack this when we look at, at Scripture? And so in Exodus 15, we read that Miriam, that's Moses' sister, was a prophetess. And, and it's really hard to sometimes to define what a prophet or prophetesses are, when even what the idea of prophesy is, because in some ways those are a little bit fluid terms. But we saw that she led the women in music, praising God after Pharaoh's defeat. So the Egyptians got washed away. They died in, in, in the sea. Their chariots were floating. The bodies were floating. The Israelites were celebrating because they had faced certain death at the, at the hands of the Egyptian. And one of the responses then was Miriam leading the women. Now you could say, well, that's leadership. But when we talk about leadership like elders and pastors, is this really what we're talking about? She had the women. So there was... There's, yeah. And... I wouldn't have any idea, objection to the idea of her prophesying because she was proclaiming what God had done. Yeah. So it depends how you define prophecy. Okay, and back in there, doesn't it say the Spirit of the Lord came upon her before she did the prophesying or not? Yeah. So the Verse that. 20, then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after yeah. her. And, and so we would say, you know, if, or somebody who's from the complementary side would say that that's fine. There's, there's, because that's not about leading, per se, the church. That's not, that's not about teaching, per se. This was about singing praises. And I, you know, none of us would have a, an issue to a, a women's choir in church. 
you know, we wouldn't say, oh, well, that's not biblical. That's, that's leadership. Well, no, you wouldn't say, you know, that's not a path you would, you would go down. And so, but that would be one of the things they'd look to say she was a prophetess. And so even prophetess, when you think about it in, in, in modern terms, could that also mean women who lead women's Bible studies, who lead women's conferences, who lead women's ministries? Could prophetess still cover what, some of what they do? And so that becomes sort of the, some of the questions. Okay, the, 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 probably the most difficult one is, is judges, four and five. We read of Deborah, who was a prophetess and a judge in Israel. That, that becomes the, the issue because the judges we saw were, were, were lifted up by God. They were used by God. And so the people came to her as a ruler and for advice. And the idea wasn't that it was simply in a political sense. So advice would have included not just legal things, but, but also moral stuff. Because within Judaism, that was all linked. You know, your, your, your morals and everything was built within the law. And so there was no real separating them. You see that in Islam also today. There's no separating the, those, those two types of things. And so they, the people came to her. And then we see with her that Deborah had to push Barak to, to go out and lead Israel in battle against Sisera. And so she had sort of almost had to threaten him to, to get off his behind and go raise the troops and get going. And he said he wasn't going to go unless she came along. And so what do you do with that? Well, the a credit a woman. It was actually the woman who drove the, the stake through, uh, through his head. She got the credit. She wasn't even part of the, the, the question until the guy fled and... and, and and he was tired, and he stopped at the tent, and she said, oh, here's some warm milk. He fell asleep, and that was the tent stake came out, and that was the end of him. And so she got all the credit. She was the one who conquered the, the, uh, the Syrian. And so, but so how would, you, how would you look at that? Is this part of the rule? Is this an exception to the rule? Could this be a response to a failure of the men? Okay. She tried. I, she didn't try to take the position. I, when I read it, I feel like she did not want the position of going out leading. Right. Yeah, there wasn't a man around man enough. to take up the mantle. Yeah. Yep. Kind of like today with a lot of churches. Seems like the moms are doing stuff and the men are not. Churches are the, are the same thing. A lot of men stand on the sidelines. They don't want to be bothered. They don't want to be harassed. They, they don't want the nuisance, and so they, they don't do anything. Isn't there a very clear warning to you when you're in the presence of Yes, church? yes, <laughs> yes, yes. There's, there's warnings about that. And so, again, how would you inter interpret that? They would interpret this and say, well, see, this, this is something that God approved of in the Old Testament. But just because it existed, does that mean God approved of it? Polygamy also existed in the Old Testament, and Jesus clearly says in the beginning God intended one man and one woman. Well, one thing uh, one pastor pointed out in a sermon is he was saying that there's passages that are descriptive and some that are prescriptive. Yep. And some people take uh, an account in the Bible and say, I can do that now. I I can do all these miracles. I can, if he did that, that he's yeah. saying that I can do that too. Yeah. Well, the the probably the the best argument would go do, would probably go back to the polygamy though, yeah. is look at the troubles polygamy brought Abraham. Then look at the pr troubles polygamy brought Jacob. You know, if you want to find next to Cain and Abel's family, the next clearest dysfunctional family in in Scripture, you go to Jacob's family. These warring little cliques between whose mom is what, what, you know, which one was loved more and who cared. It, it was a mess. 
And so it, it, didn't, it didn't say, well, you don't do this. It said, here's your awful consequences when you go down that path. And could this be doing something similar? Saying, when you go down the path and men fail in their leadership, and men fail to do what God's commanded them to do, this is where you end up. Oh, by far. And it was a credit to Deborah, and it was a shame to Barak. That text is to shame men, to say you failed. And it's a warning. All those things in the Old Testament were, are a warning to the new. That this is what happens. When you fail to hold your position, these are the things that, that happen. And so this is what you have to look out. And so, but again, how would you, that would be part of that discussion. Because theirs would say, see, this, this is something that's clearly in there. There's no way to get around it. And so... Uh, or God working with... Or God raising her up within a sinful situation. Yeah. Okay, the next one would be 2 Chronicles uh, 34, 22-28, where we read about Huldah, the, the prophetess, uh, another prophetess. And there we see that King Josiah sent the re representatives to her to inquire of the Lord. And so how would you understand that one? What was going on in the time of King Josiah? Oh, he was <laughs> what? Who was, you remember who his dad was? Eamon or Ammon? Yeah. Who was an awful, wicked king. And so they're busy doing, they're cleaning out the temple because Ammon or Ammon or however you want to say, made a mess of the temple. Brought in all the, the wicked uh, false religion stuff, the Baal worship, uh, the Asherahs, those types of things and brought that in, and so Josiah's got them cleaning out the temple, and they find the book of the law. And he brings out the book of the law, and they start reading it, and he's, he's sensing God's going to destroy them any second because they have failed in every way. So into that situation, they go to Huldah. So was that similar then to the Deborah thing? Was it saying that things have gotten so bad and so low, there was no longer a faithful man really to go to? It just seems like it had been bad for so long. I remember Manasseh was shortly before Ammon. I remember reading, it's almost like, uh, like they didn't even have the law in their mind. They didn't know it existed because yep. it had been so long. Yeah. What she says to them isn't really that nice. <laughs> what does she say to them? Well, it starts uh, verse 22 of chapter 34. So Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to hold the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Toka, the son of Hashra, keeper of the wardrobe. She, da, 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 da. Um, verse 23, then she answered them, thus is the Lord God of Israel. Tell the man who sent you to me, thus is the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king. Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense, gifts before judgment. Me. All, 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 judgment. all the way down to verse yeah. twenty-eight. Wrath was coming. Yep. Why? Because they had gotten into such an awful state. Manasseh and then I'm, and it was just a mess. You know, Manasseh the, talks about it, that that he had repented at the end, but that was the child sacrifice time. Bringing the burning the kids before Moloch, and so that was the stuff that was was going on. So, so is that really a, a, the circumstance you want to build your case on? And so that becomes your your discussion back and forth. Is that is that a sound one, or was this the exception to the rule, saying because things had gotten so bad and so terrible that this is this is this where it ended up? Last result, if I have to send a woman, then I'm going to send a young one. Yeah. Like, just, 
Yeah. And so where do you go? And so as you sort these out, but those would be the discussions that you, that you have to have. And as long as you're still talking about Scripture, then we can have those discussions. That's, that's why, again, you, you have to get rid of the ideas of discrimination and those types of things and have biblical conversations to sort it out as best, best we can. And then they'd point to Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, speaks of the excellent wife. We're all familiar with that text. In that uh, proverb, the, the woman or wife is portrayed as someone who was very industrious. The woman had business interests, bought and sold land, and also portrayed as being a very upright and godly woman. Now, does that impact our discussion really at all? Does that say anything about the church and how we, or the roles we have within the church? Well, she was also under the protection of a husband and was able to do this because yeah. of the protection of yeah. the husband. And her husband was respected in the gate. Yeah. You know what that means? He was a ruler in the town. That was his position. She was taking care of a lot of the household stuff while he was taking care of community stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so, again, would that be one? It's a wonderful text. It's a great Mother's Day text. I've used it as a funeral text. And so it's, it's a, it says wonderful things that we should hold on to and cherish to say that there's wonderful women that have been a part of our lives. And we should honor that and acknowledge that. But again, does it then, does it contribute to the, to the discussion? Does it say anything really about the circumstances or roles within a church? And so again, it's a nice text, wonderful text, but but can you make the case that they're wanting to make? Uh, then it, the next one is in the Gospels, we read the, the women were the first eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection. Now that was a great honor. And they came to the men and the men said what? We don't believe you. You're crazy. We don't believe you. You women, you're just doing this. That's, that, was, that was their viewpoint. While they were in hiding. Yes, while they were in hiding, Yes. And so these, well, but these first eyewitnesses, they, had, they, they were going to a tomb that they were expecting to have to use all their, their burial spices. They weren't expecting Jesus to be raised. So, you know, they were, not that they weren't in hiding per se, they were just going to take care of burial stuff. That's all, that's all that they were up to. But it was a great honor for them to do that. But culturally, they would have been seen as women were not even accepted as witnesses within Jew, some of the Jewish courts. They were seen as unreliable, too, too, probably too emotional. And so that was probably the, the idea. But again, biblically, that's an important position. And they came and they told the men and said, this is what we've seen. We've seen the Lord. And so that's a, that becomes a, a statement that God has used them in a powerful way. But again, does that say anything within sort of the teaching and leadership positions that the church talks about? And so in the gospel, we see women are, are regularly shown to have had supportive roles to Christ and the, and the disciples' ministry. They're, they're interact. You see in Paul's letters, he's, he's often talking about the women that are also a part of those, those ministries. Uh, in the Gospels, it gives, paints the picture that, that some of the women were helping to, to finance Jesus' ministry. That the disciples, because, you know, except for once in a while having these miraculous fish, fish catches, they weren't making any money those three years. What about the missionary endeavors? Yeah, everybody's sharing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's more, there's more work to do. <laughs> Maybe fixing clothes. Fixing clothes. Yeah. And yeah. Along with that. Yeah. So again, that wouldn't necessarily be leading and teaching or, or those types of things. It's ministry yeah. And it, and it's true ministry. Yeah. It it's it's not a, a secondary thing. Again, the roles are both roles are very important, and you you can't sort of say, well, this one's so much greater than the than the other. 
Yeah. 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 It's just like the people who write checks for, for mission funds is they can't maybe necessarily do something, but they enable somebody else to do it. Maybe they're not good talkers. Maybe they're not good at presenting the gospel, but they can support others who can. And that becomes a, a part of that too. And then in Acts 18, this would be a big one that they would will look to. It said, we read that Priscilla, along with her husband Aquila, were sharing the gospel. They were working together sort of a, as a team. And, that's, and it's listed in scripture with oftentimes both names right together. And so Priscilla helped Aquila to teach Apollos about Christ and the gospel. And so they, they had sort of taken him aside. And we see that in, in Acts 18.26. It said, he, Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So he had been, he had been sort of preaching in the synagogue. And they had heard what he said. You know, the picture is that Apollos was a, was a wonderful speaker, a good debater, that type of stuff. But they're, they're saying somewhere in there his, his doctrine was out of whack. Maybe it was still stuck with, with John the Baptist. Maybe he, they had, he had to understand the gospel portion to open that, that, that up to him, to him more clearly. But the picture is that both of them came together to, to do that. Sort of pull them to the side and say, let's, let's talk about it. Now, would that be seen like as a, as a church setting, pulling him to the side, or is that seen more like a Bible study? Yeah. A private thing. Because yeah. they didn't want to humiliate him. They were not castigating him before a group of people. They did, I don't know, I think they did it quietly, but they did it carefully. Yeah, yeah if, if you had a man and a woman and they invited somebody to their house and presented the gospel to them, would that have anything really the idea of leadership within the church? Or is that just the Great Commission happening? Jesus didn't say the Great Commission, well, only men do this. The Great Commission was to present the gospel. But again, those are, are, are different settings, and so we have to see that they're, they're used in different ways. And then they both worked with the Apostle Paul, and, the, and he, he, again, mentions them quite often, and he thought a, a lot of them. He also mentions many other women who are part of his, his ministry that had supported him in one way or another or, or helped him. And again, it becomes the question of what they were, what they were doing. And then on, on Pentecost Sunday, Peter quoted from Joel of the women prophesying again. Oops. Uh, Acts 2, 16 through 18 says, but, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, understand too that already Peter saw the last days as the first pen, on the first Pentecost. We think of last days, well, that's when Jesus comes. The, biblically, the last days already started. Started at, you know, sort of probably at the ascension sort of idea. And it shall be, and God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male and female servants. In those days I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And so some of that again becomes, what do you, how do we understand the, the word prophesy? The, the context of a prophesy isn't given here. Again, there's, there's many different types of women's ministries where the issues that you see within the church of egalitarian and complementarianism wouldn't clash at all because that's not a part of the, the, the church structure. And so... Can a, can a woman speak the truth of God without violating some rules, in a sense, in that way? Yeah. Are there different settings? Can you, can you have a, a women's Bible study? Can you even have a, a couple's Bible study where, where women are speaking? We do every Sunday morning. That's what our Sunday school is, isn't it? I always have this like thing in the back of my head, like do not rebuke an older man, or what is that? That was Timothy's. But it's it's just like every now and then, like if something does happen, and how do you 
like I always like yeah. err where I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't know if that's yeah. my kid to yeah. say that. Yeah. Where it's like I have those words, but yeah. is that my kid's? Yeah. And you know, we, I, yeah. And we, we, and we also have to, I think, see the, the context. You know, within Judaism, there was the separation of men and women. And so you had your, your separate groups. Again, that's something that's still seen in, in Islam, is the, the men have one thing and the women have the off, off the side. I still talk to some of the older people. They can remember it in churches where the men sat on one side and the women and the kids sat on the other side. Who came up with that plan anyway? <laughs> yeah. And so you, you see that there's, there's been distinctions, and so maybe the, the women ministry type of stuff of prophesying is something completely distinct. That it's not the it's not the it's certainly not the idea of the pulpit maybe, but there's still teaching roles, Sunday school kids. You know, there's there's places for for those types of things. Women women who visit women other women in hospitals, bringing their their Bible along and praying with them and encouraging them and reading reading scripture to them, and so again you have to sort out those things, look at the context as as best you can. And say, what, what? How do we understand it? And then again, we'd we'd say a lot of the question would also be, when it talks about this in the last days, was that something that was primarily to start the church in that sense at Pentecost, to start the New Testament era, or is that something that continues throughout? Because there's a whole battle on, on that. You know, how do, how do we understand these dreams and visions and, and, and everything? So that becomes a whole other discussion. And then in Galatians, we read about several human distinctions no longer mattering. This is a, a text that they'll quickly go to. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. What does that mean? Were there still Jews and were there still Greeks? Even in the church, mm -hmm. those distinctions existed, but they weren't supposed to matter before God. This is a spiritual, persons. Yeah, this is a spiritual thing. I mean, it's not when they say there's neither Jew nor Greek. I always took it as a this is not the physical Jew nor Greek. This is a spiritual yeah. when you come before when you come to the cross, the, the ground is put at the cross of Jesus. Yeah. But well, in Ephesians, it says he's not a respectable person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And even here, we have slave and free. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Paul elsewhere talk about masters and slaves, mm -hmm. how they're supposed to treat each other and so forth? So it, it didn't automatically at that time say, oh, well, it doesn't exist or you're all free. Those existences or those, those, those issues still remained. They just were not important in the church. And one of the, one of the big things with the social justice movement that you've heard sort of with the racial side is now that certain minorities should have their own communion table, that they should take communion apart from everybody else, which defies this very thing. When we come before God, especially in the idea of communion together, we're not seen in those contexts. We're seen as children of God even though there are true distinctions that are still exist between us. We're not just all neutered and we're, diff and, uh, and we're you, know, you know, just sort of formless beings of some sort. Uh, that's a, now that's the direction of the social justice. But Okay, questions or comments on that section? We're almost done. Well, I, I had a question that maybe you didn't um, get into, but... You, you know, this is looking, making the case uh, based on scripture, but is there a case to consider based on church history? That'll come up more with complementarianism okay. because church history-wise, it's, it's very limited. Uh, at seminary, I did a paper on deacons, and there they had, in some senses, deaconesses. But... What I read and did when I did the research, that was all sort of the idea of women helping other women, particularly women with children. So it'd be maybe older women, a lot of times also widows, that would come alongside young mothers, helping them with the kids, doing those kinds of things, because a lot of the families had split. 
you know, you didn't necessarily have mom and grandma around to, to help the new mom or something. And so that was part of the, the deaconess stuff. Leadership, as best I could find when I was doing, uh, was prime. If it was women leadership, was primarily in, in the cults. It, w it was it was in in the the heretical groups. Montanists. The Mont yeah, those types of things where they had the prophetesses that Jesus or the Holy Spirit was going to come or Jesus was going to come and and then that all sort of fell apart because they were all wrong and it was some little town in in what's now Turkey or you know so and. And almost all of those get weird, really weird at, at, at some point. And then we don't see a lot of it historically, if you look at, at church history, until you start to get to the 1800s. Then you have the LNG Whites, those types of things. You have Seventh-day Adventists, you have Christian Science. Uh, you start getting the Pentecostal movement in the early 1900s, which really has its roots in the 1800s. Uh, then you start seeing those types of things. Uh, uh, the Four Square Gospel Church was formed by, by a lady uh, and they were built off of her ministry in, in Los Angeles. And so, but that even became a, a questionable one because she had like three divorces and, you know, there was all sorts of... She faked her, her disappearance. Yeah, she faked her disappearance, claimed she was kidnapped, all, all, all sorts of crazy stuff, yeah. Amy McPherson, I think, yeah, yeah. So, but that's that's where some of the early in the in the charismatic Pentecostals. That's that was sort of the, and so that's really where we see in church history. And then you get to the '60s, and then it really becomes the the outside push of the world, saying the church has to conform now to what we want, and that's really where where what we face comes from. So would you? Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say with like church history. Um, you got to be careful with that because there's like we're making church history right now too. It yep. may not be significant, but um, you know the Unitarian Church, the Presbyterian USA is making history. So if the world goes on for another 200 years, someone could go back and say, "Look, church yep. history says that we can do this and this and this." And the other thing is. Um, you can't judge what is right or wrong based on more of the church did this, because sometimes yeah. the, the the ones that are doing it right are the minority. Yeah, the Aryans the Aryans almost won. Yes, they they were they were a large, powerful group that remained for a long time, even after they were sort of pushed out of the out of what would have been the Roman Empire. That just so you know, that's some of the roots of, of Islam. That's some of those videos I'm, I'm watching. Is the Aryanism, the, the hardcore Unitarianism that you find in Islam, probably has its roots in Aryanism. So wonderful studies. I've been I've been having a blast to watch. Well, it. I'm probably the only one, but anyway. <laughs> well, I was thinking because I'm thinking about like the French Revolution, where you had that rise of like the Enlightenment and yeah. humanism, and like that's denying God as Creator. Yeah. That's where all this. That's where a lot of this comes. Yeah. Rousseau, that, that type of thing, and, you know, that's the children raising themselves and all, all, all sorts of craziness. So. Okay, last section. Women have both teaching and leadership gifts to use in the church. So that would become an argument. Why would God gift people to do these things and not call them to, to be on the pulpit or to be a leader of the church itself? But can women have used both of those within a church setting without being an elder or a pastor? And so, but again, that would be one of the things. They'd say, see, God's gifted you to be able to do these things, so you have to be able to use them in whatever form. You know, some of the, the best Sunday school teachers for young children are women. They, they have just a better heart for dealing with screaming children than most parents dads do so anyway but that's a whole nother topic too anyway okay uh they would some will also say that when it talks about head in the new testament that this view says head can mean source instead of authority as in eve coming from adam so they would just say when it talks about adam's headship that they're only talking about that that adam was the source of eve that took the rib out that that type of thing they'd say say it doesn't mean more than that uh what I've read with the commentaries with some of that, though, is that's a, a real stretch to try and make that, that connection. That, uh, that's not really what it means. It, the, the headship means, means leadership. 
And then this would view it holds Paul's teachings on women were specific to certain contexts and locations and do not apply to the church today. So they would say what you find in 1 Corinthians, what you find in 1 Timothy, uh, what you find in the characteristic lists also in, in Titus, are, are simply really applying to the culture of that day. If the culture had been different, Paul would have written something different. Well, sometimes that's what we need, Larice. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so this becomes really dangerous, though. Because like we saw in 1 Timothy, if you can do this with the, the teachings on women, you can also go to 1 Timothy and say, well, we'll, we'll do this with all the, the, the moral issues. We'll do this with all the sexual issues. We'll do this with homosexuality. If, if we can make these no longer apply, why can't that just be called? And that's also a part of the argument with homosexuality. Wow, Paul was just talking about this. He had no idea what homosexuality would be in this era. So who, is, who are they really denying as the author of Scripture at that point? Did God not know what was going to happen 2,000 years from, from then? I'm pretty sure he did. He, he knows what lays before us. And so when they do this, they're, they're diminishing Scripture. They're diminishing God's part in Scripture. Then Paul becomes the author instead of God becoming the author. Whereas we saw in the text from 2 Timothy, this is God breathed, and that's what we have to see it at, and that's what we have to accept it. And so to go down this path opens up all sorts of doors that we have to really be careful with. I've heard that. First one too. I've heard that one really twisted into the sense that, well, then if you don't pursue like a upper ministry position, like pastoring, you are not using God's gift, yeah. and then you're actually in error because yeah. you're not fulfilling what yeah. God gave you to do. Like I've heard that, and yeah. that is really twisted. Yeah. And and how could this also be just simply used within the family, raising your children upright, teaching your your children properly? Yeah, homeschooling too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really tricky balance. Yeah. 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 And so, all of those things, there's places for. It's just which do we do we see that there's some roles that are still limited. And you, as you ask the question, do you have to place yourself sort of in in the garden, and God has said. You can't have these two things. And like Eve wanting the fruit, she says, I want them anyway. Is that a part of it? That would fit the second Tim or the first Timothy chapter two idea. She was deceived. Is that the same thing going on? She's grasping something beyond what God has given. Yeah, yeah. So she well, even changed that a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, for her to even say she saw it was good to make the man wise, like yeah. that positive spin. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be the same thing there, right? The right, positive, the positive spin. Absolutely. And you, can, and you can work the positive spin in a lot of different ways and still disobedient, and still, still, <laughs> still wrong. You know, all you had, we worked at the prison for 10 years. You want things that can spin things, just go there for a while. And, and you just, no, God, God's word says no. And just got to leave, leave it at that. Well, you know, I'm lonely and I need a relationship. And God said that, that man shouldn't be, be alone and therefore I should do this. You go, no, 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 no. You know, you, you know so, so if you want to twist stuff, you can make, make the Bible say, say, say anything you want. So I've seen like there'd be a, a slippery slope with some, some people um, with uh, you know denying the roles, uh, trying to find equality, uh, and, and saying that, that there is no distinction in roles, and, and that can lead into um, them now attacking God as Father, and then it's like there's there's kind of this built-in hatred or rebellion, and then. 
they just have to strip everything away yeah because yeah. they can make god into a mother yeah I, th I think it was one of the Norwegian churches that was going to try to do that to the Bible to strip all all masculine stuff from from God. I, I can't remember which which country and which which national church it was, but th yeah, th those things all all fit. And so, when you ask these questions, can one of the things if if you if you take the complementarian side is you have to ask them is is can you really detach this this train car from the rest of them can can you really separate this issue or is if you if you buy into this issue is by necessity you're going to end up buying into the other ones because you know they say oh there's no slippery slope and yet every denomination that's that's gone with the first car you know the uh, UCC, the ELCA, the United Method, all of these, once they buy it, bought into the first one, they're, they're going down the path of all the other ones, too. And so, so that slippery slope is real. You just, you, know, you just have to accept it, that it's there. So, and if that's the path you want to go down, then be honest that that's, that's, that's where you're going. If you want to just say, we're swinging this door open for everybody, God's just, and you're going to end up with universalism, you know, Rob Bell sort of type of thinking. You know, God just loves everybody so much, so there is no hell. Everybody's going to heaven. doesn't matter what Jesus did or didn't do. doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You might exclude a Hitler or a Stalin, but that's about it. Genghis Khan, possibly, you know, that, that, that type of thing. But besides that, everybody else is in. But, but again, there's no biblical foundation for that. And so in these things, that hopefully will be the discussion. And so the next two are a blend of complementarianism and then also some of the other issues that, that this impacts. And so that's what we're going to look at the next, the next two. We don't have one next week because it's Thanksgiving.